Welcome to session 12 of our New Testament survey series. Um, I am looking forward to getting through this material with you, and I appreciate your following along with us. I'd love to hear from you um, if you're watching this video, so please um, stay in touch. Uh, we, of course, have made our way through all the way through the Old Testament. We have surveyed and introduced the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In our last session, we put the spotlight on Jesus's teachings. And on this session, we're going to be looking at the miracles of Jesus or the signs of Jesus as they are called in the um, Gospel of John. Um, my name is Stephen Clyborne and I am the senior pastor of Earl Street Baptist Church in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, and if you'd like to follow along with us today, you can find the outline uh, on pages 28 and 29 of our study guide, which you can find on our website at esbcgreenville.org. You just click on the resources tab and then the Bible survey uh, tab, and you can find uh, all of the previous videos going all the way back to the Old Testament and the study guide for the Old Testament, and then the previous New Testament videos as well, along with the study guide for the New Testament. As I said, we're going to be on pages 28 and 29 in the uh, study guide, and we invite you to access that study guide and follow along with us. As I said, today we're going to be talking about the miracles of Jesus. And um, um, and as we do, um, we want to talk about uh, kind of the distinction, I guess, between uh, the miracles of Jesus and the miracle stories of the other so-called miracle workers of his time. Uh, there are a lot of there were a lot of. Um, stories that circulated called the Theos on their stories, the God-man stories, um, in which um, miracle workers, so-called miracle workers, uh, supposedly performed miracles too. So uh, what distinguished Jesus's miracles from the so-called Theos on their stories was that the focus in Jesus's miracles was not on the sensationalism of the miracle. It was not on the spectacular event itself. The focus in, in the miracles of Jesus was on meeting a human need. Um, and so um, that was a primary distinction between the other so-called miracle stories that were circulating during the first century and the miracle stories of Jesus. Um, also, miracles were uh, viewed, especially in the Gospel of John, as signs of a greater reality. So the miracles were not just uh, um, focused on, were not just about uh, extraordinary because of the event itself, the supernatural quality of the event itself, but also because of the reality, the greater reality to which the miracles or signs pointed. Um, so what we're gonna do today is just kind of look at what the miracles were of Jesus, the miracles recorded in any or all of the four gospels. And um, of course, the first miracle was the changing of water into wine. This is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And um, we looked at that miracle when we surveyed John's Gospel, so we won't spend a lot of time on it now. But according to John, it was the first miracle that Jesus performed at a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. The second miracle was, uh, was a sign um, presented in John chapter 4, verses 43 through 
54. We'll take a look at that one, even though we spent a little bit of time on that when we were going through John's gospel. Um, but let's take a look at that, um, that sign. After the two days, Jesus departed to Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, which is where he performed um, his first sign in John's gospel at the wedding, uh, wedding feast, where he had made the water into wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. And when uh, he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Jesus therefore said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went his way. And this is one of the recurring themes that we see in several of the miracles of Jesus, that um, as people believed and as people acted on what Jesus told them to do, the healing took place. And so John says, as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was living. So he asked them the hour when he began to mend and get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And of course, then the father put, put two and two together and realized that the hour was when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed, and John tells us all of his household believed, and that was the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea in Galilee. Another uh, miracle that Jesus performed was casting out an evil spirit. Um, this uh, was in Mark's gospel. According to Mark, this was the first public sign or miracle that Jesus performed. Um, and of course, in Mark's gospel, the evil spirits recognize Jesus for who he is. And Jesus, uh, in Mark's gospel especially, is portrayed as being in a, uh, a battle with the forces of evil. The next um, uh, miracle or sign was the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. This, um, this is actually recorded in all of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, there were several occasions when Jesus healed the sick. This also is found in the, um, um, all three of the synoptic gospels. Uh, there was the healing, uh, I mean, the miracle of catching fish. Let's take a look at that one in Luke chapter 5. Um, verses 1 through 11. When the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had ceased speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon said, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great shoal of fish, and as their nets were breaking, they beckoned to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. So many fish that the boats began to sink when they put the fish in the boats. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus's knees saying, depart from me for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished and all that were with him at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. Henceforth, you will be catching people. And when they brought their, had brought their uh, boats to land, they left everything and followed him. 
another account of, of a miraculous catching of fish was recorded in John's gospel after the resurrection of Jesus in what is commonly referred to as the epilogue of John's gospel in chapter 21 verses 4 through 11. Just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the beach and yet the disciples did not know yet that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, have you, have, have you any fish? And they answered him, no. And he said, well, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And they cast it and they were not even able to haul it in for the quantity of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved that is traditionally referred, uh, considered to be John, um, said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his clothes for he was stripped for work and sprang into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. Another miraculous catching of fish. Another uh, miracle or sign of Jesus was the cleansing of leprosy. Leprosy, of course, was considered to be a disease that, um, that rendered someone ceremonially unclean, ritually unclean. And when a leper was uh, coming close to other people, um, the uh, faithful Jews would often call out, unclean, unclean, to kind of mark this leper, somebody unclean is coming uh, near. And there were, um, there were um, occasions uh, in um, all three of the synoptic gospels when Jesus cleansed the leper, two occasions in the gospel of Luke, and of course the one in chapter 17 is the occasion when there were 10 lepers and Jesus healed all of them, but only one came back to thank him. And the one who came back to thank him was a Samaritan leper. Um, in Luke's gospel, um, Jesus was um, um, always uh, holding up Samaritans as being the hero of the story, as in the story of the Good Samaritan. The next uh, miracle or sign was the healing of the centurion's servant. This, this miracle is recorded in Matthew's gospel, chapter 8 and Luke's gospel chapter seven. Let's look at Matthew's gospel chapter eight, verses five through 13. As Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home in terrible distress. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion answered him, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will, will be healed. For I am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one go and he goes and to another come and he comes and to my slave do this and he does it. When Jesus heard him, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and sit at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. Jesus said, go, and it will be done for you as you have believed, and the servant was healed at that very moment. So um, this centurion came to Jesus and said, look, I know that all you have to do is just say the word and he will be healed. And the centurion said, I'm a person of authority and, and I have the authority to command servants to do this or that and they do it. So I know that if you command um, th that my servant who is paralyzed uh, would be healed, that he will. And Jesus did and the man was healed. The next example of a, of a miracle is the healing of a paralytic. Um, this, this takes place, um, is recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels in Matthew chapter nine, um, verses one through eight, Mark chapter two, verses one through 12, and Luke chapter um, five, verses 17 through 
26. This is a, a story that's fairly familiar. We're going to look at Luke's version of it. Um, on one of those days, as Jesus was teaching, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, people were bringing on a, be on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they sought to bring him in and lay him before Jesus, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and led him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Um, it's a, this is a remarkable story, a story many of us learn um, as children that uh, these, these people were so determined to get this man healed that when they couldn't get in through the door, they took this man, lowered this man down through the roof. And Jesus was so, um, Jesus was so um, uh, impressed with their faith that he did in fact heal him. There was the healing of the man, uh, of a, a man with a withered hand. We find that in uh, all three of the synoptic gospels. And you'll notice a pattern here that a lot of these a lot of these healings that are in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are not in John, and a lot of the healings that were in John were not in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We're going to look at Matthew's version of this in chapter 12, verses 9 through 14. And Jesus went on from there and entered their synagogue, and behold, there was a man with a withered hand, and they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? You might remember from our session last time, that this was a conflict that Jesus had with many of the religious leaders that he would violate what they considered to be Sabbath laws. Um, and they, they said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath and so that they might accuse him? And Jesus said to them, which one of you, if he has one sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and it was restored whole like the other. But the Pharisees went out and took counsel against him how to destroy him because he dared to heal a man on the Sabbath day. Um, of course, the most, I guess, um, uh, impressive miracles that Jesus ever performed uh, was the uh, raising of the dead. And there were uh, three examples of this. The most famous one, of course, is the raising of Lazarus, recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 11. And you might remember from our introduction to the survey of John's Gospel that the, that the raising of Lazarus was the seventh sign in John's Gospel, the ultimate sign the raising of a dead man to life. And it was that seventh sign, that ultimate sign that actually produced the ultimate rejection. And in John's gospel, it was the raising of Lazarus more than anything else that prompted the religious leaders um, to plot to destroy Jesus. Well, in, um, um, in, um, Luke's gospel, chapter 7, verses 11 through 17, Jesus also raised the widow's son from death to life. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, we see an account of Jesus raising the daughter of Jairus. So um, this was a sign of the coming kingdom. And it was a foreshadowing of Jesus's own resurrection to show that Jesus has the authority, not just over sickness and not just over the forces of nature, but Jesus had authority over death itself. Um, and as I just mentioned, Jesus had authority over uh, the forces of nature and creation. There was the calming of the storm uh, listed in all three of the synoptic uh, gospels. Uh, we'll look at M Mark's version of this, Mark 4, um, 35 through 41. Uh, 
On that day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us go across to the other side and leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was and other boats were with him. And a great storm of wind arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, sleeping through the storm. And they woke him and said, teacher, don't you care if we perish? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you afraid? Have you no faith? And, um, and they were filled with awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Um, notice that in this uh, account of the calming of the storm, Jesus sets up um, fear as the opposite of faith. So often we think of doubt as the opposite of faith, but Jesus said, why are you afraid? Don't you have faith? Um, so Jesus shows that he has even, he has authority even over the forces of nature. Um, there's this unusual story. Um, this to me is one of the most unusual of the miracles and it's the casting of demons into a herd of pigs. Uh, we'll look at um, um, Matthew's version of this, uh, Matthew chapter eight. Verses 28 through 33, there's a more extended version in Mark, and, excuse me, and in um, Luke as well. So this is another one of those synoptic miracles recorded in all of the synoptic gospels. But we're going to look at Matthew's version, chapter 8, verses 28 through 33. And when Jesus came to the other side to the country of the Gadarenes, two demoniacs met him coming out of the tombs so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, these demoniacs cried out, what have you to do with us, O son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many swine was feeding at some distance from them and the demons begged him, if you cast us out, send us away into the herd of swine. And Jesus said to them, go. So they came out and went into the swine. The demons came out of the people and went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd, when the, when the demons entered into the pigs, the whole herd of pigs rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the waters. Uh, it's, it's a really unusual story. Um, and the only time that when, um, when um, unclean or evil or demon spirits were cast out of humans uh, and then transferred somewhere else. Usually they were just cast out and they disappeared uh, when Jesus um, cast out the evil spirits. The next one uh, was the healing of the woman in the crowd. Um, which was um, Matthew found in um, Matthew 9, 20 through 22, Mark 5, 25 through 34, and Luke 8, 42 through 48. Um, while we're in Matthew, we'll just stay there and look at uh, verses 20 and 22. Behold, a woman who had suffered from a hemorrhage for 12 years came up behind Jesus and touched the fringe of his garment for she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I shall be made well. When Jesus turned and seeing her said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. This woman had such faith that she just thought if I could just touch his garment, uh, there would, that would be enough to heal me. And, and Jesus was so impressed by her faith that that he honored her faith and her faith was enough to heal her through his power. Um, in uh, Matthew's gospel, we also see the withering of the fig tree. Um, 
and um, sorry, um, I, I lost my place here. The healing of, uh, I mean, the withering of the fig tree, which is found in Matthew 21, verses 18 through 22. Um, and I'll read those. In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he was hungry and seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but leaves only. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, truly, I say to you, if you have faith and never doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Um, The, the next miracle uh, was the healing of the invalid in John chapter five. Um, and this is the, the, the man who had been, um, who, who was unable to walk and uh, he was um, at the pool of, um, in Siloam. Um, um, well, uh, in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate, and um, and the the legend was that um, the angel would stir the water at a certain time, and the first person who would get into the water would be would would be healed. And of course, um, you know the the person who is unable to walk who is an invalid is not going to be the first person in the water. Uh, you know, the first person in the water is going to be somebody who has a chapped lip or a hangnail or something. They get into the water. Um, and so this particular man has been lying by this pool for 38 years. And uh, Jesus comes to him and says, uh, and ask a question that seems at first to be a strange question. Uh, do you want to be healed? And I'm sure the man was thinking, well, the thought has crossed my mind over the last 38 years as I lay here. That's why I'm here. But it's not really, uh, it's not really um, a, a non-essential question because some people don't want to be healed. Some people have found a way to let their illness work for them. They would prefer to be ill. They enjoy poor health. So Jesus asked the man, do you want to be healed? And uh, Jesus told him to rise up, take his pallet and walk. And he, and he did. And this man who had been lame for 38 years got up and walked. And then John says, now, this day was the Sabbath. In other words, uh-oh, this man has been this man has been lame for 38 years and he gets healed on the wrong day, on the Sabbath day, and it sparks this controversy. The only um, miracle that um, well, let's see. I'm sorry. I think I might have skipped one. I did skip one. Um, the healing of the um, of the men or demoniac unable to speak and or hear, that is one that is found in Matthew, Mark. I mean Matthew and Luke, and we're going to look at Matthew's version of that, Matthew chapter nine, verses thirty-two through thirty-four. As they were going away, behold, a dumb demoniac was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the dumb man spoke and the crowds marveled saying, never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, he casts out demons by the prince of demons. Um, you know, implying that Jesus, Jesus's power did not come from God, but came from, um, from Satan. 
All right, then uh, we get to the healing of the man by the pool, which I just described. I did that one out of order. And then the only miracle to be recorded by all four Gospels is the feeding of the 5,000. It's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then there's the feeding of the 4,000 in addition to the feeding of the 5,000 in Matthew and Mark. Um, that story is very familiar to us. Uh, and in John's Gospel serves as a proxy for the Lord's Supper. Um, John's gospel does not include a, an account of the Lord's, what we call the Lord's Supper, but uh, uses the feeding of the 5,000 as a sign of um, the Lord's Supper, eating the flesh and the blood of Jesus, eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Jesus. Then there was the occasion when Jesus walked on water, uh, walked on the sea. That's in Matthew 14. John, Mark 6 and John 6. Um, and then there's the healing of the Gentile woman's demon-possessed daughter that is in Matthew and uh, Mark. We'll look at Mark's version of that story, chapter 7, uh, verses 24 through 30. And from there, Jesus rose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and would not have anyone know it, yet he could not be hid. But immediately a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children first be fed, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this saying, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Um, there was the healing of the blind, the blind Bartimaeus in um in um, Matthew and Mark and Luke, and uh, the healing of the blind man in John's gospel, uh, which became uh, a sign that Jesus was the light of the world. There was a healing uh, a boy with a demon in Matthew 17, Mark 9, and Luke 9. Um, and um, then one of the most um, um, I don't know, I, I think kind of amusing miracles, I guess is the way to say it, is uh, found in Matthew 17, verses 24 through 27. Uh, you probably haven't heard too many sermons on this. I don't think I've ever preached on it myself because I don't quite know what to say about it. When they came to Capernaum, the, the um, when they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the half shekel tax went up to Peter and said, does not your, your teacher pay the tax? He said, yes. And when he came home, Jesus spoke to him first saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tribute? From their sons or from others? And when he said from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. It's a pretty amusing story and, and most unusual compared to the other miracles that Jesus performed. Um, of course, there was the time when um, the servant's ear was cut off and Jesus healed that. That's in Luke 22. Luke 22, verses 36 through 51.
And one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. So we can just visualize Jesus takes this severed ear, places it back on the man's head, and it somehow is miraculously reattached. Um, there's the healing of the crippled woman in Luke 13, verses 10 through 17. Uh, we'll look at that story real quick. Luke 13, beginning with verse 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her and said to her, woman, you're free from your infirmity. And he laid his hands upon her and immediately she was made straight and she praised God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his ass from the manger and lead it away to water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said this, all of his adversaries were put to shame and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. And then the last one we will talk about is the healing of the man with dropsy. This is Luke 14, 1 through 6. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler who belonged to the Pharisees, they were watching him, and behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they were silent. Then he took him uh, and healed him and let him go. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well, will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? And they could not reply to this. Uh, I mean, these religious people, they were more upset that Jesus um, healed the man than they were that the, uh, that the man had the illness in the first place, and more upset that he healed the man on the Sabbath day because it was a violation of their rules. Well, this is just a, a sampling. Of course, we're just skimming the surface of all of these miracles. There's so much that can be said about all of them. But um, um, the, the miracles and signs of Jesus were, were signs of who he was and the kingdom he came to bring. Now, if you're following along with us in real time, this is the uh, coming up on the, um, the, we're in the season of Lent in the year 2021. And uh, as we enter into the final weeks of Lent, we're going to be focusing um, on the passion narratives beginning next, um, next session, the suffering and death of Jesus. So I hope you'll be a part of that. And I do hope that you will uh, stay in touch with me. Let me know what you're thinking. Let me know what questions you might have. Let me know what you want to talk about. Um, I'd love to hear from you, and I look forward to our next session together.